Welcome to this week's edition of the Pete Mazzetti Show. I'm Pete Mazzetti. My guest this evening is author Connie Bimbasi. Connie, welcome. welcome. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much. Nice to finally meet you. We've talked, we've emailed, you've sent me the book. Nice to finally meet you, and I'm glad our schedules had a chance to work together, and we're, ac we're actually here. We are actually we here. We are actually here. So, Connie, tell us a little bit about yourself, and maybe we can start talking about the book as well. Well, I'm Connie Bombasi, as okay. you said, oh, okay. and um, I've been living in Connecticut since uh, 1976. Okay. And, you know, life is a journey. Absolutely. And I believe we all have a story. And my book came out as a result of one of the stories in my life. And that story started back in 1992. I'm a dog lover. I, I always have to have a dog with me. And our daughter, who was going to the University of Rhode Island at the time, happened to adopt um, a throwaway puppy, a black lab. And she thought she could handle this puppy at school. Well, she found out very quickly that she couldn't. Ah. So the puppy came home to mom and dad and became the family dog. But as India was her name, as she got older, about a year old, we quickly discovered her energy level was a bit more than we could handle. And I kept trying to convince my dear husband, Jim, we need a second dog, we need a second dog. And he went, oh no, one is plenty, one is plenty. Well, he finally relented and said, okay, but has to be the same age, 18 months, same size, about 50 pounds, male, neutered, and short haired. I think he was hoping I wouldn't find a dog that would meet all of those specifications. <laughs> well, I started calling around the state because I believe in rescue mm -hmm. as much as possible. Yeah. And I kept calling. And I called the Connecticut Humane Society several times. And back then, it was a phone list that you'd listen to because there weren't websites. Yeah. And at the bottom of the list, it said 18 month old, male, neutered, Dalmatian, deaf. I didn't even hear the word deaf. And I told Jim all about this wonderful pup and we took India up to the Connecticut Humane Society to meet the about to become Hogan. Okay. And they got along famously. It took them about 30 seconds and off and running they went. And we brought him home. And he had never been inside a shelter never inside a home. And Dalmatians are not all weather dogs. No. And do you remember that terrible northeast winter we had? Yes. He was outside that entire time as a puppy. So we promised him he'd always have shelter, hence the name Hogan right. from the Native American. Well, in his deafness, we thought, how are we going to communicate with this guy? Being educators, we said American Sign Language. Because back then also, deaf dogs were routinely destroyed. Because the myths were, they can't learn, they're dumb. Well, Hogan ended up learning over 70 signs in American Sign Language. And we actually used over 100 with him. They were um, labeled as being vicious, that they would startle too easily. Well, you know the adage, let a sleeping dog lie? Yes. It didn't come about because of deaf dogs. All dogs can startle, right. and we have to train them. We have to socialize them. So we had to overcome all of these myths, and we taught him American Sign Language, and he was off and running, having a wonderful life. And the Connecticut Humane Society put it in their newsletter that there was this success story. Jack Hanna from, from Jack Hanna's Animal Adventures sure. was then stationed in Connecticut. And they found out about Hogan and did a, a TV segment on him called Special People, Special Dogs. And that got the ball rolling. Cool. Tufts University had never had a, do, a, a deaf dog learn American Sign Language. Um, and Dr. Nicholas Dodman, the renowned animal behaviorist, learned of Hogan, wanted to work with Hogan, and ended up taking Hogan on the Oprah Winfrey show with him, which brought international attention right. to Hogan. 
He then went on Dateline NBC and many other shows wow. like Amazing Tales and um, it just goes on and on. And we were contacted by folks around the world. How do I work with my deaf dog? How can I be successful? And he broke open that door for deaf dogs to no longer be destroyed under the guise of euthanasia. Because the definition of euthanasia is to put to death that which is terminally ill or suffering. Deaf dogs aren't suffering. No. And we would no more put down a deaf child so, right. and they can lead very successful lives. But from that, yes. Hogan taught me how to hope. He never gave up, ever. When he accomplished one thing, he wanted to do something else. And my mother, who was a very faithful woman, said, Connie, you need to write his story. And I went, Ma, I'm not an author. She said, just sit down and write. And I went, but, she said, Connie, sit down and write. Yes. Hence, Hogan's book. And it has become uh, an award winner, Hogan's story. So it is his story that brings um, limelight to the deaf dog. So that's how my book came to be. Wow. You actually have me speechless right now. Wow. Which, which <laughs> that doesn't happen do, very often. Which, which, do, which doesn't happen very often, but... Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what happened next yeah. was that the Connecticut Humane Society, about six months later, calls us up and says, would you like a third dog? <laughs> and I went, oh my goodness, um, I had a hard enough time getting Jim <laughs> to agree to number two. So I went home and I said to Jim, what if we fostered her? until we got her trained enough mm -hmm. with American Sign Language, potty trained, all house trained, right. all of that. He said, yeah, we could do that. Maybe that's our calling. Maybe that's, well, Peter, I'm a foster failure. Little Georgia, we named her Georgia, never left. She stayed with us. <laughs> and so hence I had three dogs, two of, two of whom were deaf. <laughs> And she was a pip. And in the book, there are stories about her as well. Yes. In fact, I'll tell you one. Yeah, please. Um, when Jim and I would go to work to teach, mm -hmm. we were teachers, we would put them in their crates until we felt that they were house safe. We always wanted safety first. And we had a house sit a puppy sitter come in throughout the day okay. to let them out and walk them and play with them. Well, she would put them back in their crate. Well, I came home from work one day, and the three dogs are out and running. And I said, Jim, did you put them in their crates? And he, uh, absolutely. I went, hmm. Okay, well, they must not have been latched well. So we made sure that they were latched well. I come home the next day. The three dogs are running around the house. Oh, that's not true. Two of the dogs were running around the house, and little Miss Georgia, was asleep on the sofa. I said, okay. you, you can't be, they, they, can't be, they can't be latched properly. So Jim and I decided we're gonna enter the house at the same time mm -hmm. so he can witness what I right. was coming home to. The three dogs were out again. Well, we set up a video camera. Little Georgia, from the inside of her crate, nosed the latch up she to then took out. her paw and pushed the door, the latch open. She went to her brother and sister's doors, pushed the latches up, pawed them over, and let them out. Very so, smart dog. Deaf dogs are very smart. <laughs> very smart. And I'm sure that didn't go well for the first couple days. Well, they like... thought they were having a good old time. And I looked <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. I said to Jim, I said, well, you know, nothing's destroyed. No. They were good. May as well just leave the crate door open. Yeah. And more times than not, we would come home if the doors were open, like we were leaving them. Sometimes we'd find them asleep in their crates because they liked their crates. Yeah. Yeah. But deaf dogs are very smart.
Very yeah. smart. In fact, they even became certified therapy dogs. And we would go into nursing homes and hospitals really? and schools. And there are stories about those trips um, to, the, to especially the convalescent homes. And they were amazing therapy dogs. And both received uh, awards for their work in the nursing homes. Would you mind telling, telling us maybe a little bit about your, the trips to the nursing homes? Well, I can tell you one story. Sure. Um, there was a gentle, we, we would go every Sunday, and I would rotate the dogs. I would take India, then Hogan the next week, and then Georgia, and start the rotation over again. Well, this particular Sunday, we uh, arrived, and I, Hogan was with me. And I always checked in and found out if there were new patients, discharges, anybody in particular need. Sometimes even the families needed therapy dog work. Uh -huh. And that day the nurse said, we have a new gentleman down the east wing on the far right and he's um, secluded himself. And he's not coming out, he's not doing anything. That's all we needed to hear. Everybody needs a friend. So Hogan and I went down the corridor, made a right-hand turn into the doorway of this gentleman's room, and we just stood there, knowing that the gentleman didn't want visitors. And we just stood there. And the gentleman was lying in bed, unshaven, hair was all muss, and just stood there and we turned and we left. Well, I decided that Hogan was gonna go back with me week after week until we could reach this gentleman. Every Sunday, down the corridor, make a right-hand turn, stood in the doorway of his room. One, one Sunday, I said, would you like a visitor? And he just nodded. And we went into his room and we just stood by his bed and he dangled his hand down, and Hogan licked his hand, and then he put his hand back in the bed, and we said, we'll see you next week. We turned, we left, came back the next week. The nurse stopped me and said, Connie, you must go down to see the gentleman. He wanted to get up and get dressed this morning. Wow. And we went down to his room, stood in the doorway, and he was sitting in the chair in the corner of the room, waiting for us. Wow. So we went in, we visited. Week after week, we got to know this very articulate man who was very famous in the world of media, whose family had simply warehoused him in the nursing home. Wow. Well, we arrived again on a Sunday, and the nurse stopped us. And she said, Connie, He's waiting for you. We went down to his room. And Peter, we made a turn down the corridor. Mm -hmm. Hogan pulled. Hogan never pulled on his leash, ever. So when he pulled the second time, I went, OK, OK, boy, mm -hmm. go. And I dropped the leash. He took off down the corridor made that right hand turn into the room and never had he ever climbed up into a bed. But very carefully he climbed up into the bed where the gentleman was laying again, unshaven, hair a muss. And Hogan went up and put his chin right on the gentleman's chest and just laid there. And the gentleman put his hand on Hogan's head and said, Hogan, I waited for you. And with that, the gentleman passed. So this is one of the very impactful success stories. Hogan gave this man hope to come alive again for several months before passing. And Hogan made a friend. And the nurses were standing behind me. I didn't know it at the time. Of course, we're all in tears. As and I said, I just want to leave Hogan here for a little bit. And they said, for as long as you want. And Hogan stayed there for an hour or two really? with his friend. 
So, and there were many stories like this, where he made friends, Claire, the gardener, and Elizabeth, who played the piano, and they just waited for the dogs to come in. And Elizabeth played the piano for the dogs. <laughs> really? Really. Yep, she came alive again and started playing. But as a result of the success mm -hmm. of the adult book, we decided to bring hope to children. And we came out with the children's edition. And it's two pieces. And my daughter, uh, our daughter, I always, when they're doing things for me, I say my. But they're our daughter, my husband and I, did all of the illustrating from real photographs. And all of our profits go back into the um, service award at, at Haddam Killingworth High School. Okay. Or for our deployed soldiers overseas that we send packages and letters to, or to um, animal welfare. We don't keep any profits. Wow. Very nice. Very nice. Now, as far as how hard was it to teach a deaf dog sign language? Believe it or not, it was easier than teaching a hearing dog because they're not distracted by sounds. Yeah. And the first sign that I taught Hogan was cookie. Okay. And then cookie, cookie, gave him a cookie. And as soon as he connected, mama's hands are saying something <laughs> yummy. Right. He watched my hands. And the second sign was sit because he needed to learn to sit in order to get the cookie. Ah. And then down, of course, and we just, every, and oh, when he learned those first two signs, mm -hmm. cookie and sit, in less than 24 hours of having him. Wow. So they, they learned very quickly. They're very intelligent dogs. Very, and, and cuddle bugs, just like most other dogs, just wanting to please, loving children, going into schools. There was a deaf young boy uh, at the Killingworth Elementary School mm -hmm. who had never been able to talk to a dog because he's deaf. Right. And so he signed to Georgia and Hogan, and they responded to him. That was during the Dateline taping. Okay. And we let Joey then have Georgia and Hogan walk around with him for the rest of the afternoon because he was just in heaven having animals that understood him. And Joey, I was at the high school, mm -hmm. and Joey came through the school system. And when he reached the high school, he was on the football team. So the dogs and I would go to the home games and greet Joey as he came out after the game. And he would always go to knee, take his helmet off, mm -hmm. and play with the dogs right there on the football field. There you go. Wow. So, yeah, they learned very quickly. Now, you actually just opened up my next question. You were a former educator at the time with yes. Adam Killingworth High School. Yes. Rumor has it that you had something to do with the start of the HK Holiday Show, and you and I also have a couple friends in common. Yes, well, I knew you were good people when I found out that <laughs> Chuck Lewis and Chris Mazzetti were- um, Chris Morgan. Morgan, uh, call him your last name. That's okay. Chris Morgan uh, were friends of yours. Absolutely. Yes, when I arrived at HK, I was teaching television production down in the studio. And <clears throat> I believe in giving back. Mm -hmm. to our community because we have so many blessings. And I wanted to teach the um, high schoolers, especially the TV production students, to give back. Because to have a TV studio, that's not very common no. across the United States to have in a high school. And a, a, a fellow teacher came to me and told me about a former graduate that had been in a EMT, was an EMT and had been in an ambulance crash and was critically injured. And she said, can we do something? And I said, hmm, let me think about that. And the light bulb went off, a telethon. 
let's do a telethon to raise money to help support a former graduate who was serving his community. So that was our first telethon back in 1990. And the next year, and the next year, and the next year, reason after reason, I let the TV students select. And I always wanted it to be someone in the community, at least based in the community, that we could support because it's a fellow community member. We did have a young woman one time suffering from leukemia from Madison, but that's our community. Right. It's, you know, it's, it's still our community. She was a high schooler. And the holiday show um, continued after uh, I became an administrator when Chuck, mm -hmm. when we interviewed Chuck, that was one of the questions I asked him. I said, would you be willing to continue this? And he, of course, went, absolutely, <laughs> you know, and he continued it. And now the, the, the TV production teacher that's there yep. is, is continuing it. Yes. So it's been going since 1990. I actually have a, my, one of my shows in December, I actually save to have the holiday show on with me. So Chuck, is, Chuck and the students have been on with me. Then once Chuck retired, the new teacher and the students have been on with me. Sasha. Yeah. That's wonderful, because that helps promote. And you know, Christmas is, or the holiday season, is a wonderful time because we're thinking of giving gifts, giving gifts, receiving gifts, mostly giving gifts. Yes. And that's more fun to give than it is to receive. Yeah. And the students get so wrapped up in it that they, they honestly can't wait to do it. And, and the reputation you know, it just trickles down to elementary school teachers uh, and, and students. In fact, we have elementary students that are now high schoolers saying, I couldn't wait to get here and to actually help make this show happen. Yes. And it's, it's a, the beauty of it. It takes it is, a lot of work, I'm sure. I've, uh, ne I've, never been, I've never been up there for the day that they taped the show, but from, oh, what, you have from to what I've heard, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. It starts. But it seems like it's a lot of fun. It is. It is. The one year we had to switch gears very quickly. I, I don't remember what we were doing the show for. Um, but years ago, the Toys for Tots okay. was broken into, and all of the Toys for Tots were taken for oh. New Haven. And so the students came running and, and said, we need to do something. We need to do something. So within 24 hours, the students switched gears and did two at the same time. Wow. And it was, it was phenomenal. Huge success. We had truckloads of toys, truckloads being delivered. Now, as an administrator, what did you what did you do? And as a teacher, what did you teach? I was the television production okay. teacher, and then I was the associate principal up in HK's main office okay. of the high school. Did you like it? I did. I like. Uh, I didn't like the part where I was the disciplinarian, because the rules. Yeah, that's probably no fun. It's no fun because I didn't really have much leeway. The rules are the rules, and I had to follow them just as much as the students did. <laughs> mm -hmm. And even the consequences of breaking the rules was mapped out for me, so I didn't have a lot of leeway in that. That was the only part that wasn't a lot of fun, but I liked being with the students. In fact. When we went through five principals right in a row, five years in a row, um, I was asked, why aren't you applying for principal? And I went, because I want to stay with the students. I, when you become principal, you can be with the students, but not nearly as much as you can when you're still associate principal. Now, what is your biggest takeaway about working with deaf dogs? That with hope, anything is possible. Anything is possible as long as we hold on to hope. And as Mark Twain said, kindness is the only language the deaf can hear and the blind can see. So if we hold on to hope 
and share that hope with others along with the kindness that it takes to embrace each other, whether they be four-legged or two-legged. We're going to have a wonderful life together. That's my takeaway. That's absolutely beautiful. That is absolutely I can't thank you enough for having me and oh. letting me share this story. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Because Anytime. his legacy lives on. Yeah. It does. And we still are contacted by folks, and we hope that more folks get to read it. And it, it, this, like I said, there are two, two children's books, um, and all of the profits being given back. We don't keep anything. And obviously you go out and speak at different we do. Venues? Yes. In fact, we'll be, go we'll be up at the Manchester Library on Thursday evening. All right. Yes. Um, and so we'll be there. And we go into schools. And um, sometimes we take our little deaf pup that we have now okay. um, with us. Um, Elsie is her name. Okay. And she came to us at three years of age. And she has a lot of special needs. Not only is she completely deaf, but she's epileptic. And she's got allergies. Oh, no. So, and she was never let out of a tiny crate for three years. Never out, was never cleaned. She was malnourished. So she has a lot to overcome, but she's doing remarkably well. And how old is she now? She's five. Wow. Yeah, we've had her uh, five and a half. Oh, no? She's five and a half. We've had her two and a half years. Yes. And if people want more information about the book or where they can go to, where, is there a website they can go to? ConnieBombasi.com. Okay. ConnieBombasi.com. And all the information All the information is there. on the website for how to reach you and how to get, get the book and then maybe have you come and speak. Yes, because we can share Hogan's hope. Right. And hopefully you'll be on with me again. Oh, I would like that. I would, I would like I that. that would and if I could encourage other people sure. to share their stories, because life stories can empower other folks. When I was in college, the reason, let me back up for a second. The oh. reason I didn't think I would become a writer ever was that in college, we handed in our compositions, and one day the professor came back and used three of our compositions as examples for the class. And he read mine. And at the end of it, he said, and this is how to never write. This is horrendous. This person should be ashamed of themselves. Well, of course, I wanted to sink into my seat. Yes. But no one, he did not disclose my name, thank goodness. But it broke but my... But you knew. I knew. And he broke my self-confidence. But again, like I said, with hope, anything is possible. Because hope is having the faith in what we have not seen and that it can happen. So everyone deserves hope and they can do it. And so I encourage everyone to share their life story. Not even bossy. We're about to run out of time, but before we do, I want to thank you for coming down. Thank Ho you. Hopefully, we'll see you again soon. I hopefully, hope so. you'll, hopefully, you'll come back. I would be glad to. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be Connie Bimbasi. I'm Pete Mazzetti. Thanks. Good night, and we'll see you next time.